In effect, Revit is a database. It is important to get some context and understand exactly what this means. A Revit model is a collection of elements which contain structured information. Elements are typically subdivided by model elements, which includes host and model components. Host components are generally things that are built in place at the construction site, while model components are usually things which are delivered and assembled on site. In addition, Revit also includes datums and other view specific things as elements. We will get to these a little later in the presentation. Revit calls these information fields parameters. Elements have a bi-directional relationship with other elements in the model. Element parameters can be collected and sorted in specific ways to communicate information about the model or design. One of the ways this data is presented is through schedules. Revit schedules are usually created because there is a need to quantify various elements in the Revit project. Because of this symbiotic relationship, changes to the model or design are reported instantly in the schedule. This eliminates the need to manually check drawings and make calculations. This association is further extended through tags. Tags are Revit's annotation system, which is connected to the same parameters as the elements and the schedules. This creates a circuit of information, which is why the highlight in model function only available through the use of schedules is so invaluable. In this segment, we look at field regions and understand their limitations. Field regions in Revit are only partly associative, meaning automatic updates are limited when changes are made to the building model, leading to inconsistencies in area calculations. Let's look at this in greater detail. On screen, you can see two field regions, one orange and another in pastel blue. I can take this latter region and demonstrate that regions do have an area parameter. Regions are drawn by boundaries. These lines can be associated to wall elements by using the pick lines tool and then checking the locking option over here. So now when the wall moves, the area updates. So now I can select this wall and move it out, increasing the building size, which then should also increase the region area. Here you can compare the before and after values. So it may seem as though this is a suitable solution, but let's dig a little deeper. Let me take you back to the context determined at the beginning of the presentation where I demonstrated the data link between elements, schedules, and tags. Let's try to tag this region. From the Annotate tab, I can click on Tag by Category, and then on the Options bar, I pick Tags. This lists all of the loaded tags and symbols in the project. In detail Items is the category of field regions, and a tag is already loaded, so I can click OK, to tag the selected region. This returns a question mark, which in Revit means a blank parameter. To explain this further, I will drill down into the tag via the edit button. When a tag is created, labels are added to display the value of desired element parameters. And as shown on screen, the area parameter is not available meaning that areas calculated by field regions cannot be tagged in projects. And the same is also true of detail item schedules. In summary, 
wild-filled regions are useful for graphical representation on architectural drawings. They are not suitable for precise area calculations because its data cannot be extracted. In this segment, we will look at areas and define what these are in the Revit world and also unpack why areas may not be the best option for data extraction on planning documentation. And if its name serves as any indication, this should be the best option. But is it? Let's take a deeper look. Areas are model elements in Revit, like walls and doors. Areas are located on the architecture tab in the same panel as rooms. An area element first needs a boundary to enclose it, shown here in purple. This cross indicator highlighted on screen is the area element. And this text here is the area tag, with a usable area label. The label calls out the area name and the total enclosed area in square feet. Furthermore, areas are associated to schemes. These use colour definitions to highlight specific regions of the model and these can be customised. For example, here on the car parking plan, the scheme is defining spatial relationships between the floor area, common areas and the vertical circulation. The area elements can also be scheduled. This current schedule is a breakdown of areas by level. Because of this data link, I can use the Highlight in Model tool, like so. This follows the data trail back to the element in the model. In this instance, I am taken to the car parking level, where we have, of course, car parking families. These car park families are part of the parking category, and I would like to include the car park count per area in my schedule. Over on the right hand side, I can edit the schedule fields, but these are only limited to the area category. There is no option to embed other schedule types. Whereas compared to room schedules, there is an option to embed. So in conclusion, although areas are a great tool for quantification and reporting, they lack the detail of the room elements. In this segment, we will look at room elements and understand the major differences between rooms and areas. Like areas, rooms in the Revit world are model elements. However, one of the main differences is that rooms are 3D, meaning that these elements also calculate volume. And because of this, rooms are also detectable and taggable in sectional view. On screen, the room element indicated by the X is visible. Selecting this reveals the volume parameter. As I transition to a sectional view, the element is visible. So now I can select it and reveal the same parameters. This room element can also be tagged in this sectional view, like so. But the same is not true for area elements. Here I have an area plan where the area boundaries and the area element have already been placed, meaning that I can simply tag. No area tag currently exists in the project, so I will have to install one. I can use the Autodesk Cloud Library to do so. The tag has now been placed in plan view. I can switch over to the corresponding sectional view and via the viz graphics I toggle the area element to on.
but as you can see, it's not visible. And to confirm this, the area tag is greyed out in this view. Room elements have another advantage over areas, which is an increased number of built-in data fields. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison. Not only does this make rooms easier to use when delineating subspaces, because rooms are model elements, that data leaks directly into other applications, like schemes. For example here, the space relationship is currently showing occupation by lots. This is then changed to the department parameter. The additional fields also have a direct impact in schedules. More fields mean more data and more options. Here in this example, the area parameter is used to create an additional parameter called an area ratio. Various data slices can be added via the filter. For example, here I use the occupancy parameter to filter data according to lot 2. But without doubt, the greatest difference is the ability to embed other schedules so that car park bays can be automatically counted per lot or per department, etc. Here, the parking category has been added as an embedded schedule. This schedule has then been filtered to extract the required data. I think this is conclusive evidence why any type of area plan should be done using room elements. And here is the final schedule for this example project. So far, we have established how helpful schedules are at presenting data which has been built into Revit models. But this data is only as good as the model quality. Because Revit models are so detailed, containing thousands of elements, errors do occur. So in the next part of the presentation, I unpack some management workflows to help you audit the model. Working views are a huge benefit. Working views are views that are not assigned to a sheet. And in this workflow, they are used as audit tools. Start by having a working view for each of the following. Room elements and separators. In this view, only show the room elements and the room separators. Be sure to include any room bounding elements. Next, create a working view for property lines and separators. In this view, only property lines and room separators are visible. A third working view will be a combination of all of these. The working views will help you find leaks, breaks and errors where the model elements are concerned. This will ensure that the quantified data is correct. These should be used in conjunction with review warnings. In plan view, if I select the car park family and isolate its category, and then select all visible elements, I get a total of 190 car park bays, as shown by the filter down here. However, using the Die Roots 1 filter, I get a different total. Let's have a look and break this down. If you have the app installed, select the Die Roots 1 tab and then on the ribbon, pick one filter. The filter would then take a moment to collect the data in the model. Once the dialog appears, find the parking category. This is the category for car parking families. I also have whole model checked. 
From there, I move across to the right hand side of the dialog where I check the category option. This will select all of the parking elements in the project. Notice, this time we get a total of 192. That's two additional elements. Why is that? If I move down to the view control bar and find the toggle for hidden elements, this reveals two car park bays are actually hidden in view. I can, however, quickly unhide these using a customized toolbar. But even now, with all elements selected, there is a problem as shown up here on the toolbar. There are some related warnings. The warning states there are identical instances in the same place which will result in double counting. This means the schedules will only be as accurate as the model. However, at the same time, this shows how helpful Revit's automation tools are. Using inbuilt audit functions like the warning system in conjunction with schedules will call out errors and improve the accuracy of your model. With all of this considered, the evidence for schedules is overwhelming. Upon seeing this, if you insist on using manual lines and text schedules like this, you are just making life much harder. The risk for error is too high. That's the end of the video. I hope that you learnt something new and that you found it interesting. If you did, consider subscribing and hit the like button and drop a comment. And I'll see you in the next video.